All right, so welcome back, Real Time DSP Lab at the University of Texas at Austin. This is spring 2014, and this is going over the solution set for homework four, which was on random signals, spectral analysis, and modeling communication channels all in one shot. So it's a long uh, solution set, so I'll just go over some of the highlights. So the, these are all, again, for practical reasons, these questions are being asked, they're not just for mathematical um, curiosity. Uh, practical application. Uh, mathematical curiosity is wonderful uh, by itself. Okay, so we're, the point of the first question, so I'm asking you here a question of Johnson, Saris, and Klein, and the question is basically to use, if you're given in your piece of software like MATLAB, a random generator that will give you a Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution, how can you use it to generate Gaussian distributions with different means and variances? So in MATLAB, the rand n function gives you by default, and you can't change it, uh, a normal distribution with mean of zero and variance of one or standard deviation of one. But that's okay because we can take that and modify the output of that random number generator to have any mean and variance that we want for a normal distribution. Not a problem. And that's what this this question is asking about. So if we so if we now define a new signal, which is a scaled version of this a random sequence of numbers following this normal normalized normal distribution, and we multiply by A and add an offset B, then we can change the mean and the variance uh, of the rand end. So the question is what are the mean and the variance of W? That takes a little work to get there, and we have to talk about how to get to a mean and a variance. So for a, for a mean, we're going to look at average value. So expectation here simply means what's the average of whatever is in the argument of the expectation operation over the possible range that the random variable can take. Okay. So in this case, A is a constant, B is a constant. It doesn't vary with the random variable that, that would be in the expectation. Even if we looked at it as a direct delta PDF, it doesn't matter. It's not going to change. It's a constant. So uh, A and B are constants. So when we take the expectation of uh, what's inside, A is a constant. Um, so first of all, the plus sign, um, we, can, we can take what is the average value. It's just going to be the sum of all the possible values divided by the number of possible values. So the expectation here of two things, This is just a summation sign to do the expectation. We're just adding up all the values. So this is the same as expectation of x plus expectation of y. And so, so that separates out into two, two, uh, two, two terms. And then the constant a has no bearing on what It just comes out of the summation. You can think of the expectation as a linear operation in terms of system properties. Put all zero in, you get all zero out. It's got homogeneity and additivity as it's as part of the linearity system property. Anyway, so we have now we can break that out into A times the expected value of X plus the expected value, sorry, plus B. So if we apply this uh, again, how do we compute the mean? We take all the values of the random variable, sum over all the possible value, all the uh, uh, values and we divide by n. So here we're going to let this random signal uh, w, we're going to observe capital N values of this and we're going to average, just averaging filter in the end, normalized averaging filter. So I'm going to take the, the average of the terms, the samples that I've observed and we know what that is. It's going to be w is just this affine mapping of this you know, a linear pl line plus a, an offset, so it's a times x plus b. If we work through that, the mean of w is now a times the mean of x plus b. Now, in our case, the mean of x is zero, right? It's rand n, which is by default has a mean of zero. The variance uh, requires a second order moment, um, so that to compute the variance or to estimate the variance given samples, uh, we're going to subtract off the mean and square each sample and then average over 
all the samples we've observed. So again, working through the math on this, if I scale by A in, in the mapping, then the variance will change by A squared, and the mean will change by A times the mean of X plus B, but again, in our case, the mean is, is zero. So in this case, now we can, using the rand n random number generator, we can get any Gaussian distribution we want with any variance and any mean, just with a simple mapping. So you'll see this in different parts of the code in Johnson, Thesaurus, and Klein, and you'll see it in later questions in this homework set. Okay, so next part up is to generate some random numbers that, again, will help us model noise. So we're going to use a different function in MATLAB, which is RAND. And RAND is a uniformly distributed number. Between minus 1 and 1. I thought it was 0 to 1. Yeah, that's not right. All right, so I'm asking you to, to use RAND to create a signal that's uniformly distributed on minus 1 to 1. But RAND n generates randomly dis uniformly distributed numbers from 0 to 1. So you have to find some mapping to get you from 0 to 1 to minus 1 to 1. So there's lots of ways you can do it. Well, they all come down, I guess, ultimately to this way, which is multiply x by 2 to expand the range to 0 to 2 and subtract 1 to make the range equal to um, minus 1 to 1. So if we take the new random variable that will get us the range from minus 1 to 1. Okay, and again, why is this useful? Well, uh, we can generate random bits this way. We can generate random bits this way, or we can also use the normal distribution. But if we want to generate uh, bits or symbol amplitudes, equally likely we would go to the uniform distribution. So this is a way to generate 2PAM, or BPSK. We'd like to amplitudes. We'd like to have amplitudes of minus 1 and plus 1, and this is a way that we can get there. Okay. Now some tricks, some, so I'll, one of the surprises in MATLAB, and it's not just MATLAB, it's anytime you have floating point, that this operation is done in floating point by default in MATLAB, you may not get back an exact integer. It may be 0.9999, whatever. So you're better to be really, really sure that if you want an integer out of this, then add an operation. What would you add? Round would be good here. Round would work. That would force all the values to be plus 1 or minus 1 exactly, not approximately. This can throw off your MATLAB code if you're not aware of this. You want to, you know, ultimately, I'm asking you to give me, actually, in this case, it's, it's um, uniformly distributed and it's over a continuous interval. If I want to now force this to be um, plus or minus 1 only, then I can just compare y against 0, and that should do it in MATLAB. Almost, that almost does it. That almost does it in MATLAB. Uh, what I can do is um, round will do it. So if I apply round to y, as you suggested, then I'll get plus 1 and minus 1 only as a result. Now, there is a crazy chance I get 0, by the way. It could happen. All right, so you'll be a little bit careful here. So maybe uh, sine would be good. So SGN would be good. Um, so I could do, so this would be continuous to get discrete, plus or minus 1. I forgot in MATLAB, is it SGN or is it Signum? I can't. It's SIGN. SIGN, that's right, that's right. Again, there's a crazy chance you get zero. Yeah, it's pretty, un pretty unlikely to be exact. Yeah, in this case, pretty unlikely. All right, now if I um, plot 
So here I'm doing the noise in the time domain and then the frequency domain. And in theory, this, this plot in the frequency domain, this is a magnitude, um, should be flat. And it's not. So the theory will, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, the theory says that if I have infinite observations, if I can observe the noise over an infinite period of time, infinite amount of time, the, the Fourier trans, the power spectrum is flat. But if I have a finite observation, I want to observe over a finite period of time, I don't get a flat magnitude or power spectrum. I get something that, you know, wiggles. So what I can do is I can, I could probably eyeball an average value and call that my noise floor, my noise power over, over that, over those frequencies. Right, so part B was to use, again, to use the, the continuous uniformly distributed random variable from minus 1 to 1 to give us a you know, bit pattern. And you're right, you just use sine to do that. Okay, and again, I point out here that there is a possibility you get a zero out of this. It's pretty unlikely. I think it, so basically the double precision floating point number would have to be zero. So out of the 64 bits, if it's if it, that's your bit pattern, like one out of two to the 64 chance, it could happen, but probably not going to happen. Okay. All right. So now the next question is to you know use this what we derived earlier to create. The signal that's wrongly distributed with mean zero and variance three, and we already know how to do that from earlier, earlier derivation. All we have to do is multiply the rand n function by square root of three in amplitude. And because the variance works with the square of that, that becomes three. Square root of three squared is three. There's no change to the mean because rand n already has zero mean, so I don't have to add any offset. I can just use rand n as it is. Now, this is important because remember, in communication systems, we're going to measure signal to noise ratio. I know what the signal power is on the transmit side. We've talked about that. This allows me to vary the noise power in simulation, which gives me different signal to noise ratio measurements or um, received signal strength, if you want. There are lots of ways you can think about this, but the received signal would then have different SNR values based on. The, uh, the variance of the noise that we put into the system. So the signal-noise ratio will be the transmitted signal power divided by the variance of this noise. That's our SNR measure. So in simulation, we can vary the SNR by varying the, uh, the variance. Right, so here, the variance will become 3. So I can change the variance, simulate, change the variance, simulate and look at the communication system performance at different SNR values by changing the, the noise power. So I keep the signal power the same, I just change the noise power, and that would change the SNR. That's coming. And in fact, you sort of see it in problem two and three. Okay, pseudo so noise sequence, a wonderful sequence, and that's another underlying theme in this homework set. The PN sequence, if it's long enough, is amazing. It gets through additive noise and it gets through um, frequency distortion. It's amazing. Amazingly robust signal. We use it for calibration, we use it for training when two modems connect. Incredibly useful signal. We use it for audio test and measurement. Just a way cool signal and it's easy to generate, as you know from Lab 4. Now the nice thing about why is it such a neat signal, and you know it looks like noise. It, if you play over speakers, it sounds like noise. Um, if it's long enough period, if it's not long enough period, you'll hear some tones. But uh, long enough period would sound like noise. Noise is, doesn't have a period. Right? Noise is aperiodic. So for a PN sequence to look closer to to make the PN sequence look as close to noise as possible, we'd want as long as a, a PN sequence as possible. So as long as during the observation time you care about, we haven't repeated the PN sequence, it's going to look and sound like noise. It's going to act like noise. But it's got structure to it that we can take advantage of. In the frequency domain, what's really nice about this signal is 
and doesn't go to zero anywhere. So I'm showing you the magnitude here in dB of a length 31 PN sequence. Maximal length, so it rep you know, its period is 31. Now, it, I show you here in dB, so don't be confused. That's zero dB, not zero linear units. Okay. So in linear units, it's one. So what's nice about this is when I send the signal over um, a channel, I can then look at what's received, and now I have an estimate of the frequency response of the channel. Because I know what this is. So if I send this over the transmitter, if this becomes you know, X of N, it goes over a channel, LTI model, H of N, and I observe the output, then what I can do is I can estimate the frequency response of the channel, which I'll need to do if I want to compensate for its distortion by simply dividing what I observe at the receiver based on what I know I transmitted at the transmitter. That's an extremely useful signal. All right. Now, the phase response isn't linear. There are parts of the phase response, I suppose, that you know, you could argue maybe it's sort of got maybe some piecewise linearity in there and then some parts that are not fitting that. So it's not a linear phase, but it's, you know, it's got pieces that are, I suppose. All right. Next thing is to, well, that was problem 4.1. 4.2 is to figure out, I'm going to give, you get a uh, transmitted data vector that's got a bunch of random bits and then a PN sequence for a marker that you want to find, and a bunch of random bits. All right, and this is a problem in communication system. The receiver has to figure out when the transmitter is starting to transmit data. So it's going to look for some. It's going to look for a marker in the transmitted waveform to know that we're ready to go. The transmitter is doing something. It's not quiet. It's actually transmitting something. So I'm going to be looking for this. And now oh, I can use the header for lots of other things. I can use it for synchronization. I can use it for estimating the channel impulse response or frequency response. Very useful signal. All right, but let's look at it just as a marker for now. So I'm, I'm asking you to look at different length data vectors, and I ask you to try out two different marker sequences. Again, this is a problem from Johnson, Saris, and Klein. So I ask you to look at a sequence of all ones for your marker, and then length 31, and then a maximum length PN sequence of length 31. All the entries are plus one or minus one in this problem. It's two PAM BPSK encoding. So when you run the code on, this is the code I gave you on the homework, Ken. Okay. So if I run 10,000 uh, trials, each trial has many bits in it, right? What I end up as a result is that um, I make a mistake with a header of all ones about 50% of the time. Or you could be optimistic and say, I correctly detect the marker 50% of the time. And it's not really good. If you want to connect Wi-Fi and it only connects half the time when it should have connected, you know, I think you're a little frustrated. Now, the PN, the PN header looks like it never misses. I mean, it looks like it's perfect. Now, again, if you go to your supervisor at work and you say, my communication system works 100% of the time, your supervisor will hopefully laugh it off and, and understand that you just need to simulate more bits to see the errors. All right, so in this case, uh, we don't generate enough bits to see, to see an error happen. All right, so basically I make this comment. So if you, you know, the, the problem, so, so why is this happening? So if it's a marker of all ones, then it can easily be fooled um, in detection. So if it's a marker of all ones, then what happens is if I have a bunch of random bits ahead of the marker of all ones, So here are the random bits. But if I if this bit happens to be one, it's going to fool the detection half the time. I'm going to get the wrong location. It doesn't matter what happens to any of these other bits to the left. If this one's a one, I fool it. If this one's a zero, I don't fool it. Right? So half the time, I'm going to make a mistake. I've also added some noise to this problem to make a little, you know, to give a little more error. But if you see right at pretty much 50 percent. Half the time. It gets it right if you're optimist or it gets it wrong, I guess, if you're a pessimist. Now, for the PN sequence, what's really nice about the PN sequence, if you shift the PN sequence to 
If you shift the PN sequence and correlate, you get close to zero result. So if your PN sequence is off by one, shifted by one, and you correlate against the PN sequence and it's self-shifted by one, they're basically uncorrelated. And the answer is one over the, the length of the PN sequence, if it's normalized. And, one, and you get one when they're aligned. Or you get the peak when they're aligned. So if you just put a, so if I have a PN sequence for my marker, and this is a random bit, you're not going to fool the PN. That random bit ain't going to help you at all. You're going to fool it all because you're going to get a correlation probably down around 1 over L because you're shifted by, you're off by 1. So the only way you can fool the PN approach is if the random bits that are, are in the front or out, it has to be before the marker. If you get 31 consecutive random bits before the marker and they happen to be exactly the same as the PN marker, then you'll fool the detection. And that happens one chance out of two to the 31. So it can happen, but you've got to run a lot of bits to see it get fooled. All right, so you're going to have to run 10 to the 11th bits to see the PN marker sequence fail, or the PN marker fail once. It might fail more than once, but you're pretty at that many bits, you're pretty confident you'll see at least one failure. Okay. Uh, so I'll just give a comment on problem three. On problem three, this is now a communication channel with uh, frequency distortion modeled by an FIR filter and additive noise, and the PN sequence gets through no problem. The marker of all ones has a miserable time. Okay, markers of all ones, averaging filter, all the energy is concentrated at DC. The PN sequence, all frequencies represent it. It can get through a channel that has nulls in it. All right, thanks. We'll see you on uh, see you on Monday. Thank you.